Uh, hi, uh, this is uh, joint work with my uh, collaborator, Stal Winterbo. Um, so, um, so here is the common machine learning procedure. So what happens is that you know, there are many machine learning algorithms which involve one or more parameters. So for example, you know, a most popular example is k-means where you know, there's this parameter k, the number of clusters, or if you're, doing, you know, if you're looking at histograms, then you know, there's the bin size, or if you're looking at classification, there are regularization parameters. And to be honest, nobody really knows how to set these parameters properly. So what people do is, uh, you know, um, they, uh, they, you know, they have this training data set, and then they train for a bunch of values of the parameters. So you know, they try, let's say, you know, ten values of the regularization parameters or ten values of the number of clusters. They get ten results. They use a validation data set to figure out which of these perform the best, and then you know, whichever performs the best on the validation set is output. Right? And this is called the training and validation procedure. And you know, in any kind of practical machine learning system, this is, uh, this is used extensively. Okay? So the question that we would be looking at today is how do we execute this kind of a training and validation process privately? Right? And of course, uh, by privacy, I mean differential privacy. Uh, so here is the definition of differential privacy. I don't really need to repeat it at this workshop, but uh, I would like to make uh, one, one quick point here is uh, here I'm going to call epsilon, the privacy parameter, I'm going to call it the privacy budget. Okay? Uh, so uh, what are the properties of differential privacy? Well, so it has a number of excellent properties, and here are a couple of them that uh, I'm going to use later on in the talk. Right? So the first uh, thing to note is, you know, how do we design differentially private algorithms? Well, you know, differentially private algorithms, they are all, uh, they're randomized algorithms. And uh, usually the key idea involved in designing these algorithms is that you add some kind of noise or randomness. And the goal of this noise or randomness is to hide the effect of one person's value, right? Because, you know, one person's value shouldn't make a big difference. So you try to hide the effect of one person's value when you output a differentially private algorithms. Uh, the second property that you know we would kind of use in this uh, uh, talk about is what happens when you do data reuse. So if you uh, you know if you apply a whole uh, uh, on on the same data set, if you apply a bunch of differentially private algorithms, then you know then then your privacy risk uh, gets worse. And for example, uh, you know the the simplest such statement is that if you reuse the same data k times with epsilon differential privacy, you get k epsilon differential privacy. And then there are much more stronger statements when you look at epsilon delta differential privacy by Dwork, Roth, Plum, and Vadhan, and more recently by um, O and Vishwanath. Okay. Um, and uh, so what are the trade-offs when you want to do you know, machine learning or statistics or any kind of data analysis with differential privacy? So it turns out that there is typically a three-way trade-off. And the trade-offs are between privacy, accuracy, and sample size. So what you could do is you could get both privacy and accuracy, but your cost is going to be a lot more data. And similarly, uh, you know, if you sacrifice, uh, you know, you could, uh, you know, you could, for example, if you are willing to sacrifice on accuracy, then you could get privacy and sample size and vice versa. And as we will see over the talk, that this uh, theme will show up. Okay. Okay. So uh, why does training and validation, you know, what is the problem when we try to do it with differential privacy? So, you know, let's look at this procedure. Here what we are doing is, you know, we are trying to do everything with differential privacy. We are using, you know, so each training parameter, you know, we are training for a bunch of parameter values every time we use privacy epsilon, right? And then we are doing validation and then we have the output. The problem here is that we are reusing the training data a whole bunch of times, right? In fact, k times for k parameter values. And as a result, the privacy budget is exceeded, right? So the privacy budget used up is k epsilon, whereas we were hoping that we could get away with epsilon, okay? So, uh, so what, what, what could you do? So, you know, here are two, you know, very naive approaches. One thing is you take your privacy budget, you split it into k portions, and then while you are doing training, so for each, you know, each time you do training, you use a privacy budget of epsilon over k, right? And, uh, you know, this would work, this would give you a, a, an answer, but the problem is, because we used a lower privacy budget in training, uh, what would happen is we would get less accuracy. Right, because you remember the three-way trade-off: privacy, accuracy, and sample size. We keep the sample size fixed. We are using a lower privacy budget, 
right? So more strict, we are st more strict about privacy, so we would get less accuracy. Okay. Uh, the other kind of uh, you know baseline approach that we could think about is you take your training data set and you divide it into a bunch of disjoint sets, right? So you divide it into k disjoint sets, and you know every when you train, you train with each of the disjoint sets, right? In this case, because the sets are disjoint, you know you you would still get privacy budget used would be epsilon, but because you're using less training data again, the solution is going to be suboptimal, right? So you would have uh, less accuracy because you are using less training data in doing the training, okay? So what we conclude is that, you know, both of these approaches could be suboptimal, and the question is whether we can do better. And it turns out that, indeed, that is the case under certain conditions, and we would, uh, you know, go, uh, go ahead and identify uh, these conditions, okay? So we call our condition the stability condition. So this is a bit different from the other kinds of stability that Avradip talked about. So this is a, uh, an, uh, a different kind of stability condition. So before we uh, define the condition, let me, uh, I need a couple of definitions. Right? So the first thing I would like to define is the validation score. Because uh, remember we talked about, uh, you know, we used the validation data set to determine which of these training sets output, which of them was the best, right? And the validation score is uh, the measure of, you know, quality there, right? So it is best according to this validation score. So the validation score is a function which takes two arguments. The first is the output of the training procedure, and the second is a validation set. And the larger this is, it means uh, your performance is better, okay? So now let's look at what the validation process, what the validation process is trying to achieve. So here are the parameters. You have a training set T, you have a validation set V, you have some parameter set P, you have a training algorithm and the validation score, right? So what you could do is for each parameter, you know, each uh, parameter in P, you could look at the output of the training algorithm with that parameter and the training data. And then you could compute the score based on the, uh, you could compute the validation score based on the validation data, right? And what you would like to do is to find the parameter in the, you know, parameter set that privately, you know, or approximately maximizes this, uh, this, uh, this validation score, okay? So, you know, as we know, so to do this, we need to hide the effect of one person's value, right? So, um, when can these scores change? So, these scores will change when the, one person in V changes, right? So validation set changes, the scores can change, move on up and down a little. Turns out these scores will also change when one person's value in the training set changes, right? Because if you change your training set a little, whatever output of the training set you would get would also change a little, and then the score would change as a result, okay? And, uh, and turns out that that is key in our approach. So in the standard method, when you do the analysis, what you would do is you would assume that the event, so remember A is a randomized algorithm, so the event that would hold is uh, A of T comma P is equal to A of T prime comma P, where T prime is one step away from T, and then assuming this event holds, you would use some kind of noisy maximization to hide the effect of change of one person's value in the validation set. And what we do, is to use noisy maximization to hide the change in T and V together. So that is, uh, that is the key idea behind this uh, work, okay? So how do we do that? Let's try to formalize. So um, before I formalize, let me use uh, one more definition. So I am going to represent a differentially private algorithm in a slightly different way from what you're accustomed to, okay? So this algorithm A, because it's a randomized algorithm, I can write it as a tuple. The first uh, item in the tuple is a distribution, G sub A, which is independent of the, uh, of, the, um, of the sensitive data. And the second item in the tuple is a function F sub A, right? So what happens is, uh, and the procedure can be looked at as follows. You draw a random, uh, a series of random numbers from G sub A, and then you output F sub A of D and you know, various other parameters, and R, where R is the random number that you drew from G sub A, right? And I would like to remark that F sub A is deterministic, right? So essentially, the randomness is concentrated in the draw from R, and you know, you draw some random number, and you output a function of the random number, which uh, it's a deterministic function, okay? So, uh, so here is the training stability condition that we need. So suppose you are, uh, you have a score Q, 
it's we call uh, we say that it's b1 delta training stable with respect to a training algorithm a a parameter set p and a privacy budget epsilon if for all parameters in the set for all validation sets uh, and which probability 1 minus delta over this r uh, if you change your training set by one person and if you keep your random draw r fixed then the score uh, then the validation score will not change very much right so here in this equation you know b1 over the size of the training set measures how much it would change and the key point is that we are keeping the same random value fixed right so we are keeping the same random value r fixed and we are changing one person's value in the training set and we are looking at how and we are keeping everything else fixed and we are looking at how much the validation score changes okay so this is training stability uh, the next thing is validation stability and you know let me remark that this is actually much more standard so what this says is that if you you know if you keep the essentially the training part is the same so the output of the training procedures are the same but if you change one person's value in the validation set then the the, the score does not change too much the validation score does not change too much okay and uh, we will say you know something has this uh, this entire procedure has b1 b2 delta stability if it has b1 delta training stability and b2 delta validation stability okay so uh, so now we have defined the stability condition let's look at how this will give us better uh, private validation uh, so remember this was the problem that we are trying to solve we were trying to find a parameter value to privately maximize this uh, validation score what we do here is we look at the max of the the changes due to the change in the training set and the <coughs> validation set we uh, for each parameter value we calculate the score and we add noise which is proportional to that beta which is the max right and then we output uh, so we add this noise to each score and then we output the the parameter value uh, in the set p that maximizes that uh, the noisy score okay and uh, so essentially again the 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 key you know intuition here is that we are looking into you know how much the score changes when training and validation uh, changes and what uh, and then this is our full algorithm what we do is you know we do the training we get a bunch of uh, <coughs> we get a bunch of let's say the outputs of the training algorithm we use our validation procedure and we get the parameter value we do a retraining with this parameter value and then we do this output and it turns out so in our paper we have to use this procedure it turns out that we can you know in some <coughs> more recent work we can remove the retraining step as well um, so there so we would you know directly output ci but uh, anyway so for the purpose of this talk we do some retraining and then we get the output okay and this is what we can show if the validation score has this b1 b2 uh, delta over k sta uh, stability property with respect to the training algorithm the parameter set and the privacy budget epsilon over 2 then the whole procedure is epsilon delta private so you know before what uh, what would happen is we would have to use epsilon over k for training and now you know uh, what's what's happening is that we are using epsilon over 2 so uh, okay so i have uh, defined this uh, you know training stability uh, training and validation stability property and uh, i have shown you that uh, you know once this property uh, holds we can get good validation you know good uh, validation uh, procedures now the question is you know when when does this hold right and uh, so we have two examples in our paper uh, one is linear classification and i'm going to tell you in more detail about linear classification uh, another one is uh, histogram density estimation so for that you would have to look at the paper and you know these are two very basic problems in statistics and machine learning so um, and uh, so let us uh, look in more detail at linear classification so in linear classification what happens is that we are given a whole bunch of labeled vectors which are drawn from some high dimensional space and so these vectors come from a distribution p over labeled examples and what we do want to do is to find a vector that separates the pluses and the minuses for most points from this distribution okay 
And uh, the key here, which you know, the you know, which is uh, the basis of a lot of theory of you know, statistics and machine learning, is to find. Uh, <coughs> so, so remember that you know these are drawn from the distribution. So we are not just interested in separating the training data, but also future points that come from the distribution. And it turns out that uh, the key here, so that you know, so that it generalizes well, is to find a simple model that would fit the training samples. So uh, one of the ways to do it is by empirical risk minimization, and you know this can be uh, you know this can be made private. And let me tell you, uh, because of the shortage of time, let me tell you a little bit about one of the private algorithms, right? So one of the private algorithms, which was uh, in in our previous work, was is the following: uh, you are given a bunch of label data, uh, x i and y i. Uh, what you want to do is to find a vector w that maximizes the sum of three terms, right? So the first term is you know, half lambda, the norm of W square. And this term is called the regularization term, and it measures the model complexity. The second term is uh, sum over all the da training data points, uh, sum L of yi, W transpose xi. And in some sense, so this is called the risk. This is something that uh, measures the training error in some sense. and. Uh, the third term is a perturbation term, and so this is a you know one over n b transpose w, where b is a certain perturbation vector which is drawn in a certain way, and uh, this is the term that gives you privacy. So you look at a convex optimization problem, which is the sum of these three terms, and then you solve it, and then the answer that you get will give you differential privacy, provided certain conditions on the loss function holds. Okay. And uh, so, for example, one of the things that you could do is you could take the risk, uh, the L, the function L, to be a uh, logistic loss, which is again a commonly used, uh, you know, the commonly used uh, loss used by uh, machine learners. And what you would get at the end by optimizing is a private logistic regression. Okay. So, and uh, here is what we can show about uh, private logistic regression. So here again, remember the parameter was the regularization parameter lambda. It's not immediate apparently, uh, you know, just by looking at, uh, at it, how to set lambda. And in practice, again, people do this training validation process. It depends on your data set. Uh, so, you know, it's the, uh, so the parameter here is the regularization parameter lambda. Uh, so for validation score, we use, uh, sorry, the negative of any L Lipschitz loss. So, you know, typically one of the things that you may want to use is the classification loss. So we can't, you know, do it with the classification loss because it's not, uh, it's not smooth, it jumps. Uh, but if you have any L Lipschitz loss, uh, it works. So your validation score is the negative of any L Lipschitz loss. And what you can show is that this, uh, Q is uh, this validation score is beta one, beta two, delta stable with respect to the training algorithm A. If you have a set of lambdas and the privacy budget epsilon, if uh, sorry, if B one and B two uh, are these uh, particular numbers, so B one is going to be twice L. L is the Lipschitzness over lambda min, which is the minimum lambda in your set, and B two is going to be the minimum of uh, the max value that Q could take and uh, this quantity. Right, L over lambda min times uh, this uh, this quantity, um, and uh, so uh, in this quantity, and finally we you know we look at some experiments, uh, some preliminary experiments with this method. Um, so the methods that we are using are you know obviously uh, stability is our method. We look at data split, the method we talked about where we you know use disjoint training data sets. Epsilon split, the method where we split the privacy budget epsilon. Random is where we just pick a random value of lambda. And control is where, you know, this is like an omniscient method which knows the right value of lambda. Okay? And the thing to notice is that random and control already have a bit of an advantage uh, because they don't use any privacy budget. So we assume that you can take the entire epsilon to train. They don't use any privacy budget to find anything, right? So they have an inherent advantage. Um, and the two data sets that we used are the dull data set, and we kind of did some feature selection uh, to bring the dimensions down to 252 dimensions and about 45,000 samples. 
And then another data set uh, called MAGIC, you know, this is again another UCI data set where we had 10 dimensions and about 19,000 samples. And we divided the data into you know, training set, validation, and test sets. So the results are reported on the test sets. How well they do is reported on the test sets, where the training set was 80%, validation set was 10%, and the set, test set was 10%. And these are kind of typical values that people use while doing these kinds of experiments. Okay. Yes. What, what again is the control? Uh, control is when you, um, you know, when you are omniscient and you know what your right lambda was okay. in the set. Okay. And uh, here are some results with, with mean square error. Uh, so on the x-axis we have epsilon. Uh, the pink line is control. So control is when you you know when you were omniscient and when you knew what lambda was and you could use your entire budget for privacy budget for training. And so you know it's no surprise that it does the best, right? So lower means better. Okay. Yes. Why is pink not flat for magic? Uh, yeah, because it's uh, it, it knows lambda, but it's train it's still training using differentially private training, right? So it knows. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, the two green lines are uh, uh, are essentially epsilon split and data split, right? So the two green lines are when you know um, you know when you are um, yeah. So so the, I guess the two green lines are um, essentially when you are doing this procedure where you are either d dividing the data into k. Uh, K parts. I think here K was maybe seven. Um, I have to look up the paper, but the K was seven. Uh, when you are doing the training over the K parts, or you are splitting your data into K disjoint sections. Okay. And random is again you pick a random value of lambda from the set and you just train with that. But again, you know you have a slight advantage in the set then, since that you are using the entire privacy budget for training. Okay. And the red line is stability. So as you can see that in the beginning, when uh, the privacy budget is very small, stability is doing slightly better than you know, alpha, uh, epsilon split and data split, but not too much. But as your privacy budget increases, slowly stability does better and better. And finally, it does about as well as, uh, as, well as control, which is the uh, idea. Yes? What's the baseline non-private error on these? So just to understand how much more um, you pay for I don't exactly remember. Uh, so my co-author did the experiments. I don't exactly remember. A question from Monica. So the, the the reason for the the noise in the stability, the, the error in stability, can you separate it? So you, you are doing actually two computations. First, you are estimating the parameter p, and then you are doing right. an epsilon. Right, retraining, to the yeah. private computation, yeah. but then uh, <laughs> if if one is more dominant, maybe you want to yes. spend more epsilon, uh, more yes. of the privacy budget in computing p. Yes. Then that is a problem. very good question. So what Kobe is saying is that you know instead of splitting epsilon over two, epsilon over two, maybe you could split you know epsilon over uh, you know three and two epsilon over three for the training. So for this these experiments, you are absolutely right, and I uh, suspect that those would definitely help. But for these experiments, we haven't done that optimization. You're absolutely right. That would definitely help. So we have here used half and half. We haven't uh, looked into that. And so in conclusion, we provided a generic validation procedure, which would work, provided these uh, you know, uh, stability conditions hold. Uh, we showed that it applies to regularized linear uh, classification and uh, histogram. We have also shown in our paper that you know, if you want to use histograms to do density estimation, then these things will also work. Um, and for future work, you know, one of the works is to remove the retraining step, which we have kind of done. Uh, and we are in the process of writing it up. And it also applies uh, and find you know, more other learning problems or find some more generic conditions under which these, uh, this kind of, you, know, you could do this kind of a procedure. Okay. So if you go back to your uh, beta 1 and beta 2, for typical settings is one much larger than the other? Or? Um, that is a good question. So that kind of depends on uh, how you choose your uh, training set size and validation set size. Right? Mm -hmm. So if your training set size is quite large, then you know then this would be small, right? So this part would be small. So uh, generally, 
your training set size has to be about d you know for for <coughs> the training algorithm to work has to be about d log dk over delta over epsilon mm -hmm. right and so this is this is kind of a constant um, and the Qmax is usually so okay so for Qmax is uh, so here what we used was we used a loss called ramp loss to choose the validation so ramp loss is just a smooth version of zero one loss mm -hmm. so there actually Qmax was bounded by one I see. so there uh, so that that was good actually it would be one uh, yeah so there Qmax was bounded uh, Qmax was one so that was really and good. L over lambda min was larger than that yeah, yeah. But if you use something like you know hinge loss or logistic loss for even for the validation, then it could be unbounded, and then this would be the this is what you would use. Yes. So you can imagine there are cases where the parameter, the privacy parameter, depends on some other parameter of the algorithm as well, like I don't know, like the kernel bandwidth or something weird like that. Is that sort of is there any case, is there any case where somehow you can't do this just generically? somehow the second step uh, well, well, what, uh, could you clarify? Uh, never mind I'll take it off clearly not thinking about it. 